Unlock your best self with the Life Hack Pack from More Labs. The Life Hack Pack contains two bottles of morning recovery, two bottles of Dream Well, and two bottles of Liquid Focus. The Life Hack Pack is specially designed to help you live your life not just better, but smarter. Morning recovery is designed to be taken while drinking or up to an hour after your last drink. Dream Well is designed to be taken 30 minutes before you're ready to fall asleep. And Liquid Focus is designed to be taken 30 minutes before you have to lock in and get stuff done. Supercharge your productivity at home or work with the Life Hack Pack from More Labs. Use promo code RADIO15 at morelabs.com to get 15% off your first purchase of the Life Hack Pack or any of their other great products. That's promo code RADIO15 to take advantage of this great promo of 15% off your first purchase at morelabs.com. The Life Hack Pack for More Labs. Drink smart with morning recovery, sleep easy with dream well, and get more done with liquid focus. You can finally do it all with help from More Labs. Welcome to Turnpike Sports. I'm Dave Weishaddle, and as always, I'm joined by my producer and co-host, Doug Weishaddle. Doug, interesting NFL weekend. Uh, one game was postponed. One game was moved to Monday night. It, very, very interesting. But um, actually, uh, by my calculations, I think we both did very well in our picks last week. Oh, yeah. Well, I went 2-1. and one. I think you did 3-0. and oh. I did 3-0. and oh. I came back from my horrible 0-3 oh weekend the weekend before, but uh, came back with a vengeance. Well, you know, it was nice to see what the NFL did and was able to roll with the COVID cases, too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, they moved the uh, Chiefs-Patriots game to Monday at, what was it, 7, 7.30, something like that. 7.05. On, on CBS. And, uh, and they moved guess- back the other game to 9. Yeah, yeah, but we're still waiting about the uh, Tennessee Titans, which well, it looks like is that's, a mess right now. Well, it so. looks like it's being moved to week seven or eight. Yeah, so yeah, so and, we'll 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 figure that one out. But it was actually kind of interesting to watch how they uh, responded to it. Uh, NBA finals are still you know going well. I mean, it's actually a fun series to watch. It is. It is. I actually uh, over the weekend I actually went with Miami. They were plus nine and a half, and that's the game they actually won. I thought they yep. would keep it close. They actually won it. So, uh, yay, Miami. Well, I actually have a bet placed uh, in a couple different sports books with uh, as a four two uh, Lakers win. So okay, uh, yeah, no, I, think... I, I didn't. I didn't expect Miami to sweep, get swept. So yeah, Miami's yeah. too good to get swept. Well, you're on pace uh, for that one. Uh, you must be very happy. Yeah. Uh, we got a great show coming up. Of course, we're going to have our NFL Week 5 picks coming up. Hopefully, we do just as well this week. We're also going to have a Turnpike Sports Book Report where we talk about what's going on in the sports books across the country. And I'm going to have a very interesting interview about eSports. Uh, the book is called The Book of eSports. It's written by William Collis. And it's a fascinating book at the evolution of eSports and where it's going. And you can actually read the book and chart the development the different games and the different leagues and the it, it, and where it's going with colleges and universities it's a very interesting book though it's called the book of esports and i'm going to interview the author william collis it's been a busy week in sports so let's take a trip down the turnpike today's trip down the turnpike is brought to you by drizzly your online liquor store available in over 95 cities across north america drizzly offers a huge selection and competitive pricing with a side of personalized content now there's no need to leave the house get alcohol delivered in less than an hour by drizzly head on over to drizzly.com and order today and now get five dollars off your first order of twenty dollars or more when using our promo code drink 19 at checkout shop beer wine and liquor with drizzly.com exit one 
Okay, we just had a whole bunch of states reporting record handles for the last couple of months, whether it was New Jersey, Nevada just announced theirs for the uh, past month in September, highest ever. Um, but one thing that everyone is also talking about is the fact of the post-PASPA sports betting handle numbers that have been coming out. So this is, they're measuring their sports betting handle after the Supreme Court allowed sports betting across the country a couple of years ago. So this, this is kind of a uh, recap of what's happened since sports betting became legal everywhere, right? This is from June of 2018. Okay. All right. And as everybody knows... These have to be crazy numbers. They're, they're actually not that crazy. I really? thought they'd be okay. a little higher. All right. But, uh, but again, more than $25 billion has been legally bet in the United States since the repeal of the professional... An amateur sports protection act in See, 2018. I, I think that's remarkable. I, I think 25 billion. If you're not impressed by that, Doug, I want to. You're buying lunch today, then. <laughs> well, I, the reason I'm not impressed is because we did have a slowdown with oh, the yeah. COVID okay. and everything else. If you look at it that way. This number could have even been higher. Yeah, yeah, okay. I can see where you're going there. Okay, I mean, if you if you look at some of these things, it's pretty damn impressive. It, it's very impressive in terms of. The overall number, given the slowdown we had because of the pandemics, and also some of the, and the uh, sports stoppage, and and, yeah. and also some of the other issues with that sports stoppage, where like a lot of states had the in-person registrations, that sort of uh, situation going on. But right now, it's twenty-five billion, and there are four states leading the way. Okay, Nevada is number one as usual. Makes sense. Uh, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, then Indiana. Hmm, okay. Now, Nevada's, Nevada's handle since two, June of 2018 is just around $10 billion. All right. Jersey came in with about $7.7 billion since the start of legalized sports betting in the United States. Okay. Which, given the short term in, in, in comparison with the Nevada books, that's actually an impressive number. Sure. I, th I think Nevada has been doing it for so long. You know, there's – and New Jersey, I think you're going to see those numbers increase and, you know – and 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 some other states might be uh, coming around the bend too. I mean, uh, Illinois. I'm waiting for Illinois. I'm always impressed by uh, Colorado. I think they're going to be making some big strides this year. And uh, I, those numbers are interesting now, and they should be really interesting to see what states are added to these uh, numbers. Well, what's also more uh, impressive as well with New Jersey is their revenue numbers since that time. Mm -hmm. They have brought in the sports books in New Jersey have brought in $532 million in revenue okay. since June of 2018, which is a crazy number if you look at it All right. in terms of everybody else there. Uh, revenue in Nevada for that same time period was $600 million. Uh -huh. So they're pretty damn close yeah, 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 in terms of generating revenue. Over in Pennsylvania, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania has brought in $2.7 billion in handles since June of 2018. And that should increase. I think that should really... I, I mean, they don't have... They have online sports, but, you know, there's going to be a lot more online sports betting uh, markets, and there's going to be a whole lot more uh, or, uh, operators coming into Pennsylvania. And ra rounding out the billion-dollar club is Indiana. They okay. just passed the billion-dollar mark okay. two months ago. Okay. So that's still a young market, too, mm -hmm. which is very impressive for that. I think one state to look at coming up, if they ever, actually ever pass this, is Ohio. Ohio's got an incredible sports betting bill on the docket where they can have 33 skins, online, retail. That may be a market to watch in the coming year. But you were right. I think Colorado may may hit billion first. Yeah, I, I didn't else. know you were going to talk about Colorado in Illinois. So I didn't, I didn't even think that you were going to mention it. So No, but... But, yeah, but you know... That's just how evident it is that Colorado and Illinois are going to be yeah. major, major players. I think up. what's going to be fun to watch is the September numbers. Oh, oh, absolutely. I mean, first full month of NFL betting. I mean, yeah, NFL. You have the NHL earlier. Uh, well, it just ended in August, but you have the NBA finals. You, you the have the MLB baseball. baseball. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm, I'm very curious to see where the bump is going to be with all these other states coming in, especially in September here. Yeah. Exit two. I didn't mean to do this, but coincidentally, 
this exit matches what we're going to be talking about later in the show with William Collis, the book of esports. Oh yeah, the yeah. evolution of the uh, the entire industry as you know as a sport. Yeah, yeah. And what we're going to talk about here is some of the newest big brand sponsorships that have been announced for esports. Okay. Riot Games has brought Mercedes Benz to the table as a sponsor. Wow. Okay, that's yeah. pretty impressive. That that is actually a very high end brand brand for uh, an esports industry here. The deal includes uh, Mercedes Benz sponsoring the World Championship of League of Legends, the Mid Season Invitational, the All Star Event. Also, Mercedes Benz will be the presenting sponsor of the trophy ceremony at all major international events for Riot Games and League of Legends. They have really gotten involved in esports, huh? Oh yeah, boy, yeah. Uh, they're also going to be all over it. They're also going to be doing branded content and commercials for okay. the esports events on you know wherever you see them broadcast, Twitch, all these other things. I'm, so, I'm curious to see all the other the, platforms. Do you think they'll be in broadcast, the traditional broadcast medium, or do you think you'd have to see who's going to be airing it too? Okay. Because a lot right. of the TV contracts are kind of weird with some of the sponsorships, mm-hmm. and you got to watch the language that they have for there. But I think on the Twitch platforms, the also social media stuff, you're going to see a lot of. Mercedes-Benz, and League of Legends. Over on the Madden football side, now everyone loves Madden football. Absolutely. And uh, it's actually fun to watch the actual eSports tournaments that they have for Madden. Didn't you check it out a couple of months ago, or what, wasn't it on TV that actual players were playing Madden? And uh, Was ESPN carrying that? Or ESPN car- always carries the Madden. Oh, they they always do. That that wasn't just special no. for the pandemic. No, that, and, they do that all the time. And huh? this past Madden tournament had a very unique winner because he won the entire thing without throwing a single pass. In That's the right. I remember you talking about Jersey that. Kid. Okay. Yeah, I remember you talking about that. Okay. Leave it to someone from our state to yeah. be a stubborn pain in the butt and do things his okay. way, different than everybody else. So uh, you can say the Madden NFL is not a passing league. No, no. <laughs> he, sh- he showed it. He showed it. For this year's tournament, they have now just doubled the amount of sponsors they brought on uh, they had from last year. Uh, three big ones came on board, Gillette, Campbell's, and Oakley. Campbell's Soup, all right. Well, since you mentioned Campbell's. All right, well, let's talk about Campbell's. Campbell's Chunky Soup will sponsor matchups in several tournaments in the upcoming season here. Will they have special labels when I go out to the uh, supermarket and I go down the soup aisle? Will I see? It's uh, only on the tournaments. It hasn't crossed over I was hoping Campbell's would have uh, special eSports labels that you can pick up. No, it has not crossed over into your shopping aisles yet. No, not yet. Uh, Oakley will be the presenting sponsor of the new Derwin James versus the World Series. Now, Derwin James is the Los Angeles Chargers running back who is not playing this year because he got hurt. Okay. So he's going to be doing a series of Madden uh, esports against uh, other players, and this is going to be sponsored by Oakley. Okay. Uh, Also, Gillette. Gillette's going to be sponsoring the Gillette-style zone in the yard. It's a... uh, special mode that's in the Madden NFL 21 game that allows people to customize their avatar. You know, the image of the player that you see on the screen, they can actually customize it in terms of hairstyle, facial hair now, <laughs> and it's going to be the Gillette style zone in the yard for the this upcoming season for all the Madden tournaments. You're going to be able to customize everything about yourself, your look. Wow. Okay. So that's uh, that's a nice little wrinkle and yeah, they made that especially for Gillette, and I think that was a good move. Nice. Exit three. We've been talking about a lot about NASCAR lately. I know last week we talked about Michael Jordan starting a team. Sure, a, yeah. a one car team with Bubba Wallace as the driver. Hey, all you need is one car. Well, all right, takes is one winner. Yeah, and they, he's got probably one of the best drivers out there right now. Absolutely. So NASCAR has now announced their upcoming racing schedule. And what everyone was was anticipating was what tracks are going to be involved. And NASCAR has, over the last couple of weeks, been promising some really radical changes in terms of what tracks they're going to be doing and what types of races they're going to be doing. And they they came through with the promise because they have announced their first dirt race for the Cup Series since 1970. Dirt race? Dirt race. Oh, oh, is any special car? Are these NASCAR type cars? Just on dirt, but they're on dirt. Yeah. 
Yeah, wow. Now the the do first they, do they need special tires for that or uh, I mean they, it's, they it's have be a weird. They have everything all I've never seen... worked out for these things. So uh, the teams know what they're doing. Uh, I I believe, you know, the the one thing I noticed or I hadn't noticed before this pandemic season with the e racing was how different the tracks really are when when they're racing on them. Mm-hmm. Because the virtual tracks were actual exact replicas of the different tracks that they race on. And I noticed the difference between the dirt tracks and the uh, asphalt tracks that, you know, even virtually that you could see a difference. Well, let me tell you something. I, you know, I'm not a huge, huge NASCAR fan, but you're telling me they're uh, racing on dirt. I'm watching. Yeah, <laughs> I'm watching. So, well, the other thing that they did. Interesting to see. The other changes in the lineup of tracks. They have dropped the Kentucky Speedway, the Chicagoland Speedway, Dover International, and Texas Motor Speedway each lost a race. Where did we see that? Uh, Dover International We Speedway. got sent there by one of the radio sh- stations we're on on another Fox. show. Yeah. It was, yeah, and they gave us tickets, and that was the first time I ever went to an actual NASCAR race, and that was Dover, Dover in Delaware? Dover, Delaware. Yep, Dover International Speedway, and they lost a race. L- lo- yeah, lo- lots of fun. It yep. was very inter- interesting to see, but uh, wow, B- bring some ear protection. Oh, yeah, that's, that's why they give out those headsets. That's the loudest sport I've ever been yep. near. I mean, uh, that was incredible. I, I mean, we were with a couple of people, and we, we I, I couldn't even talk to the person I was next to because they couldn't hear me. I couldn't talk after the race either oh, because my, God. my ears were still running. Well, I, I had uh, the earpieces from my uh, phone, and I just put them in there. So it was a little better. I mean, you know. But, no, it, it was a lot of fun, though. Well, the big news, besides dropping some races, picking yeah. up some races and el- elsewhere, uh, is the dirt track. Uh, this will the, it'll be intrigued. at Bristol. It'll be at Bristol, which is a big track for them. Uh, the uh, and I'm going to read this to you here. Experiment with a dirt race by filling the .533 mile burling, bull ring, which is in the middle of the uh, uh, arena. They have bull uh, rodeos there. Okay. They're going to fill the bull ring with dirt for the first race of its kind since Richard Petty. Wow. Won at the Half Mile State Fairground Speedway in Raleigh, North Carolina back in 1970. Well, let, let me tell you something. The one time I remember dirt racing because as a very small child, when we went to the New Jersey State Fair, they had a raceway, racetrack, and part of it was dirt. I mean, I also saw a, a uh, demoli- up, demolition derby. That was a lot of fun. I always refer to them as smash up derby. It was weird. All the, the it was interesting to see because they backed into each other. I, I guess they didn't protect want to the go motors. protect the motors. Yeah, I was like, why are they backing into each other? And I guess it's to protect the motors. Yeah, but no, that was the last time I saw cars on dirt in any competitive fashion, and that was the New Jersey uh, live anyway. That was the New Jersey State Fair in the early seventies. Well, to finish out the NASCAR schedule changes, right. one snub that caught everybody off guard. Uh oh. They uh, did. They took the race away from the Tony Stewart owned Eldoro Speedway in Ohio. Interesting. Now, did they give any reasons why they're leaving tracks off and putting tracks on? And according like that? to NASCAR, they're trying to avoid the quote unquote cookie cutter tracks that lacked oh, okay. variation or originality. Well, hey, like I just said, I'm intrigued by the dirt racing. So uh, I'll look I'll, at that. I yeah, absolutely. We'll check that out. Exit four. And last but not least, the uh, NBA finals have been going on here. And at the end, they always get the trophy, the Larry Brown championship trophy. Mm -hmm. Now, back in January, the NBA had done, had had announced a deal with Louis Vuitton. Okay. The high end fashion uh, designer. Sure. 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 Um, So. Everyone's been waiting. I'm, I'm to see. sure most of them use their uh, Louis Vuitton luggage because they're the great bags. Well, everyone's been waiting to see what Louis Vuitton and the NBA would be doing. All right. The first thing has to deal with the NBA Finals. They have created the first ever travel case. See, for, I told for you for the league's championship <laughs> trophy. Wait, oh, oh, the, oh! It's the case for the actual trophy. Yeah, that's all they've. Oh, okay. oh hey, here, that's so. that's yep. cool. Yep. Actually, it's it's an interesting trophy. It took six craftsmen and a hundred hours to design and make this travel case okay. for the trophy. Uh, the case features the Louis Vuitton iconic monogram pattern and a white V, sure, sure, which stands for victory, with red and blue trim, and also 
it, it the interior of the case is lined with blue microfiber featuring the NBA logo woven into it. Everything is really a combination of Louis Vuitton and the NBA brand, the red, white, and blue brand of the NBA. So it actually looks really, really cool to uh, take a look at the picture of this, the, the Larry Brown trophy inside the case. I hope they give something to all the players, too. I mean, you know, give, give them a Louis Vuitton bag. Or well, I'm like sure there are oh, little geez. swag bags that are yeah, given I'm, out. So I'm sure they have Louis Vuitton bags yeah. anyway. So, <laughs> Well, how about if you have a uh, sponsorship with another designer and you're wearing the Louis Vuitton I swag? They, do stuff? Have, do, I don't know if NBA players have sponsorship with designers. And I wonder if that will be a trend. It well, might start a trend. You will see a trend coming soon because okay. not only did they do the design design the case for the trophy, they will now be doing uh, distributing a new footwear with a wow. co-branded footwear. Wow. All right. It's a wheat-colored ankle boot. It looks like a work boot. Um, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to, I, I, I got to. Check out the internet for this. Yeah. Like, they have pictures of it? They have pictures. Okay. I'll check it out. And it's suede featuring gold foil branding. You know, NBA and Louis Vuitton all uh, over the shoe. Uh, wow. Okay. Gold eyelets, you know, for the laces. Wow. And gold monogram flowers on the midsole toward the heel. I, I'm, I'm typing it now because I'm very curious to see what it looks like. Keep speaking. The NBA. The, I, I just want to give you a chance. Here. No, no, I want to. The NBA logo is stamped on the tongue in gold. Okay. Uh, and again, similar go, uh, co-branding inside NBA and Louis Vuitton inside this the uh, the boot. It's an ankle boot. Okay. Uh, no release date announced yet, but this is another example of this oh, high-end collaboration. Looks they nice. are nice, aren't they? Oh boy, they look nice. So it, it's it's actually nice to see they're slow. Everything got slowed down because of the pandemic, sure, of course. Sure. But the the case was the first thing they were going to be doing, and then now they're going to be doing this boot. And Louis Vuitton has been doing this for a while now with different sports. This is not. This is their uh, about their fifth collaboration. Yeah, no, they I, had trophy cases for the World Cup, the America's Cup, the Rugby World Cup. And the Roland Garros tennis tournament. Okay, I'm looking at the shoe right now. It looks really nice. I mean, it's kind of a gold. It's a it, it's a suede kind of gold. What, what, what did you say it was? Wheat colored ankle boot. Yeah, no, it's really it's nice. nice. And, and no, also, nice I see job. the uh, case for yeah. the trophy. That, that's that looks beautiful. And to wow. tie everything into okay. this this obvious theme we have in today's show. Louis Vuitton also partnered with Riot Games. Okay, more esports on ready-to-wear League of Legends apparel. Wow. Okay. So, the NBA Louis is Vuitton uh, is a little busy uh, this last couple weeks, huh? Oh yeah, no, no. Louis Vuitton is doing well with all these different sports, and the NBA is showing off some style. And today's trip down the turnpike was brought to you by Drizzly, your online liquor store. Available in over 95 cities across North America, Drizzly offers a huge selection and competitive pricing with a side of personalized content. Now there's no need to leave the house. Get alcohol delivered in less than an hour by Drizzly. Head on over to drizzly.com and order today. And now get $5 off your first order of $20 or more when using our promo code DRINK19 at checkout. Shop beer, wine, and liquor with drizzly.com. And as always, you can get in touch with Turnpike Sports by calling or texting us at 609-512-5910. That's 609-512-5910. At Turnpike Sports is the show's handle on Facebook and Twitter. At Turnpike Sports Radio is our handle on Instagram. And as always, our email address is info at turnpikesportsradio.com. And don't forget, you can listen to the show via Spotify, Amazon Music, iTunes, Radio.com mobile app, as well as uh, Stitcher and YouTube. You can also watch us on your smart TV, Roku, Amazon Fire, Apple TV. Head on over to TurnpikeSports.net. You'll be able to watch our video channel there. Stick around later on. We have our NFL Week 5 picks. See how we do coming up. And also, we have the Turnpike Sports Book Report, where we talk about what's going on in the sports books across the country. But coming up after this, I'm going to talk with William Collis. He is the author of the Book of Esports, which is an amazingly fascinating and entertaining book. It looks at the evolution of esports what's it been doing throughout the years, and where is it going? So it's a very interesting interview. Uh, I also like the fact that he pinpoints the start of esports at a different point in time than everybody else Absolutely. Has. I always thought it was Pong, but uh, no. He, Not uh, according he to says, William. No, it goes back further. Very interesting interview about the book of esports with William Collis coming up right after this. Stick around. We'll be right back with more Turnpike Sports. 
Attention Medicare recipients and anyone turning 65. Medicare has approved new benefits not included with original Medicare and older Medicare Advantage plans. You may not be getting all of the benefits you're entitled to, including in-home aids, telephone appointments with your doctors, home-delivered meals and prescriptions. These benefits may be available, and it's a free call to enroll. The new plans may also offer free eyeglasses, free hearing aids, free wellness visits, and gym memberships. Call the Medicare Benefits Line now. It's easy. Call 800-217-1797. 800-217-1797. Find out if you're eligible for new benefits like meal and prescription delivery, in-home aids, and telemedicine. Some plans may have a $0 monthly premium or zero copays for big out-of-pocket savings. Not all Medicare Advantage plans are alike. The new plans have more benefits for many people. Call 800-217-1797. 800-217-1797. Turnpike Sports is brought to you by Drizzly, your online liquor store. Available in over 95 cities across North America, Drizzly offers a huge selection and competitive pricing with a side of personalized content. Now there's no need to leave the house. Get alcohol delivered in less than an hour by Drizzly. Head on over to drizzly.com and order today. And now get $5 off your first order of $20 or more when using promo code DRINK19 at checkout. Shop beer, wine, and liquor with drizzly.com. Auto Accident Help Desk is a marketing agency connecting callers with attorneys. Providers pay a fee for advertising services. I love getting my kids ready and driving them to school. But a careless driver can change your life in an instant. And insurance companies want to settle on the cheap. Auto Accident Help Desk connects victims with powerful lawyers. They fight for you. I called Auto Accident Help Desk and got help for my pain and suffering. Don't let an insurance company take advantage of you. Our attorneys fight and beat big insurance every day. Call 800-757-1255. 800-757-1255. If you've been injured in an automobile accident in the last six months, you owe it to yourself to make this free call with no obligation. We're available 24-7 to help you get the money you deserve for your pain and suffering. Auto Accident Help Desk helps accident victims like you every day. Call 800-757-1255. 800-757-1255. That's 800-757-1255. Welcome back to Turnpike Sports. Anyone in the gaming industry knows that esports have exploded over the last couple of years. Players have become stars. Celebrities have become involved with it. Professional sport leagues and owners have jumped on board with esports. States are even allowing betting on esports. But how did this whole industry start and where is it going? A great new book has just come out that talks about the evolution of esports and where it's going in the future. It's called The Book of Esports, and to tell us all about it, we have the author of The Book of Esports, William Collis, on the line. William, thanks for joining us. Are you kidding? It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank you so much. And then thank you for writing this book. It's such an amazing book with an amazing amount of information. And, you know, it's esports is so new to a lot of people, and it sounds like a broad term. But for people out there new to esports, what are we talking about when we talk about esports? What kind of games are involved when we talk about esports? Yeah, great, great question. So essentially, you know, esports. Like, I mean, just like regular sports, right, the definition is flexible. You know, there's different lines you can draw depending on, you know, what you perceive to matter or be important ingredients. But broadly, esports are just their multiplayer competitive video games. And the difference of why esports are sort of really blossoming now as opposed to, you know, decades of, you know, when games first came into being is the skill cap, the professionalism, and the media interest around the games has driven so much and grown so much that, these titles are now behaving more like traditional sports because they have real access to sponsorships, eyeballs, et cetera. Um, you know, I think it's worth pointing out, I always like to kind of stress this to people who listen, you know, like when people hear games, I think they often go to Super Mario, right? <laughs> Imagine, you know, the little Mario running through the level with jumping on Koopas or whatever. And it really is important to note that games are so far beyond, I think, that entry point today, particularly in the esports world. 
they're multiplayer, you know, oftentimes played between teams of three to five people, right? They involve really sophisticated teamwork strategies. They involve incredible precision commands. I mean, top players have APMs or actions permitted of 300 or more in some games, which is literally issuing a command every fifth of a second. So that has come a long way from Mario, and the skill cap is really very high. You know, like you said, esports have really blossomed over the last couple of years. How did you become involved with esports, and what was your inspiration for writing the book of esports? Yeah, well, great, great question. So, look, I mean, I've just been a gamer my whole life, and I think that's true. You know, I'm in my you know 30s right now. I think that to some extent is true of many people in their 30s. Is you know, I was part of the Nintendo generation. I just grew up being fascinated by interactive electronic media. You know, and I think games and the quality of games really blossomed during my childhood. So I've just been, you know, I'd say a lifelong fan of video games. But that obviously doesn't translate into writing a book and being an expert. And so what happened to me is, you know, I was actually sort of in a traditional business career for management consulting and brand management and things like that. And I saw just the growth in eyeballs on these games and I was just flabbergasted you know you were at the time having the LCS which is the big championship series for League of Legends it was approaching it was exceeding the NBA or the M Major League Baseball for viewership numbers and you know I just kind of thought to myself I have to get involved in space um, because I'm a you know, passionate gamer and I see that these games are really becoming sports and so I ended up raising a significant amount of venture capital for my first business in the space, Gamer Sensei. It was a coaching platform because, believe it or not, back then you couldn't get a coach for video games, <laughs> um, which might sound strange to some listeners. But, you know, honestly, like you need a coach for tennis or a teacher for piano. So you probably need someone to help you master League of Legends or Overwatch or things like that. So that really pulled me into the space professionally. And, you know, it's been kind of uphill roller coaster ride from there. Um, but in terms of the book, I was actually asked to teach esports at Becker College. Um, and Becker College has a very prestigious sort of game design program in the American Northeast, and I was really flattered. And so, you know, I was basically going to be one of the first esports faculty members in America. And I showed up to class, you know, I said, yes, it's going to be awesome. And I thought, I'll show up to class. There'll be all these great resources to use. You know, I'll just assigned some textbooks and I showed up, there was nothing. Like nobody had done any research or really written anything about this space, you know, because it was so new. And there I was thinking there would be like an esports 101 textbook or something I could just assign. And so I realized very quickly there was just a massive opportunity for somebody to put together kind of a definitive overview of the space that would help orient newcomers, you know, and people who are curious about games, but also have a lot of stories, insights, and importantly, frameworks and predictions that appeal to experienced gamers, right? Mm -hmm. And so that led to the creation of the book, and here we are on this radio show. Well, you mentioned you grew up in the Nintendo generation. Well, I grew up in the late 70s and the early 80s, and I was pretty much addicted to my Atari 2600. I always joke on this show that I think Pong was probably the first e-game, but uh, you actually address that in your book, and you say that esports started... Before Pong, actually, uh, when did esports actually start? Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, I I kind of have a, a, a controversial view for this, but I sort of trace the origins of esports back to pinball machines, actually. Mm-hmm. You know, so you know, over a hundred years ago. And the reason for that is, if you think about pinball machines and kind of like the pinball arcade culture that grew up around them, you had kind of all the ingredients for esports in an early form, right? You had these pinball boards that you manipulated with your hands and your body, you know, similar to controllers or keyboards today. You had a machine that was giving you input and output and scoring. And, yeah, these pinball arcades, like high scores and the competition around it became really competitive and really drove sort of cults of personality, you know, around local players. Think about the song Pinball Wizard by The Who, right? I think that kind of exemplifies the phenomenon. And so what I point out in the book is, look, people always sort of had enormous respect for people who could be good at games, right? But, you know, and, you know, really, you know, for ages, right? But now that respect is just shifting as electronic games and video games have become such a major part of our culture and our daily life for most people. And the book goes in, there's a whole framework that explains why now um, it's called uh, the SCARS framework, which essentially argues that there are four precursor factors you need for something like esports to bloom, skill, community, accessibility, and reward. And really what's driven this most recent burst is 
the uh, the um, the reward element for the first time because the eyeballs on the space you can earn a lot of money and so it makes sense for people to devote their lives and livelihoods to it. You know, I was so glad you brought that up because if you look down on my notebook, I ask about the scar factors, and I think it's such a great way that you explain that. Uh, you also have other four factors that need needed to move competitive gaming forward for businesses, and that's the BAM factors, B-A-M-S. What were those factors that need to be needed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I should say before I answer the question, I don't want listeners to think like the book is this very boring, dry no, academic no, it's, it's book. Not, it's, not. <laughs> you know, like I, I, it's the opposite. I really, my number one goal was writing something that was fun to read and, you know, candidly relatively short. Like I think games are an absolute blast and I wanted something that you could, you know, read in three or four sittings get a lot of knowledge and laugh along the way, right? But at the same time, you know, I have a, you know, relatively serious business background, right? Like I went to Harvard Business School and things. And I I wanted to have some rigor around the structure and discussion of the space sure. because there really wasn't any. And so these frameworks that I introduce are, they really, for the reader, they help orient the argument and the narrative of the emergence of esports. But also, you know, hopefully they, they lay some signposts for, you know, how the industry itself can move, grow going forward. But specifically for BAMS, that's the monetization model for the publishers employ. Mm -hmm. So it stands for, oh my God, I've got to remember these, it stands for Blades, Advertising and Assets, Microtransactions and Subscriptions. And those are essentially, one thing the book argues is that the evolution of games has largely been driven by the evolution of publishers discovering new and clever ways to monetize their titles. And so... The, the essence of it is things started with what is called the Blades business model, which is razor and blades, which actually comes from the shaving industry. It's this idea that you sell the, you know, the basically the system at a low price. So in, you know, the shaving industry, it's you sell the, the razor at a low price, but then you sell the blades, the blade replacements at a higher markup because you've locked the consumer into the system. And so that's exactly what the console industry did. And the console industry sells you the hardware, the console, relatively cheaply, right? It's still expensive, but it's marked down significantly or subsidized from what it would otherwise cost if it were just a direct purchase. But once you bought a console like Nintendo, you had to have to buy the Nintendo games. And so you can reap the profit or the revenue back on the incremental game purchases. And so modern gaming really started with that model. And it invented all these other great ways to monetize going forward, like subscriptions or microtransactions. And now we're in a world where you don't even necessarily have to make money on the game itself because they're media properties, these advertising and assets that you can sell around the game, like franchises and things, actually allow the games to monetize independent of direct games revenue itself. Is it absolutely safe to say that without the rise of the Internet, there would be no esports? Was that the most... Was that the single most important thing and creation that launched esports, the internet? I mean, yes and no, right? Like, I mean, the internet is just so fundamental to how it's reshaped our lives. Like, you know, just millions of things would look so completely different without it. You know, like, mm -hmm. think about how many of us do our shopping, right? Amazon, that's an entirely new business model that's born out of the fact I can click a button and buy online. But it is true that for games, more than most industries, the internet helps massively because these are the big advantage esports has over traditional sports is it's competitive activities that are purely digitized. And so competition can transmit entirely over the internet. So now I can find an, oppo an opponent for my games in Poland or France or Brazil or China, right? And I can build a much broader and wider community, which is what's driving so much eyeballs and attention on these sports is it's a truly, these games are truly global sports properties. You know, anytime we talk about esports on this show or any show we uh, we do is uh, tw the Twitch comes up. I mean, and other forms of social media. How, how important was Twitch to the esport community, and how did that build the community? Yeah, I mean, Twitch is really one of two modern trigger points for the success of the industry. So I mentioned the scars factors and reward before. Twitch was really the moment, and for people who don't know, listeners who don't know, Twitch is a live streaming platform where basically I can stream myself playing video games from my desktop at home and I'm finding an audience of fans. 
and the fans that they like me can subscribe to me or issue donations to me. And Twitch really caused the current explosion in modern esports because it invented rewards for pro gamers. Before, the way you made money in esports is you would win tournaments. And those revenues are very unreliable. And candidly, they were also relatively small until recently. You know, you could take home 10 or 20 or maybe $40,000 for a big global championship. But, you know, that's not exactly NBA-level returns, right? But Twitch created this cult of personality around gamers, right? Almost like Instagram influencers or other things. Um, you know, gamers would now have direct, reliable revenues because the subscriptions were recurring. So they could know, hey, every month I have a 1,000 people who pay me $5. That's $5,000 a month. Maybe I should commit to this thing and see where it goes, right? Mm -hmm. And then as a result of the eyeballs they gathered, that brought in sponsors and advertisers, which is another revenue source. And the sponsors and advertisers started to pay for the tournaments, the boys the tournament revenues. So Twitch was truly one of two catalyst points for the modern ecosystem because it created this, the reward factor for being a pro. And it's still, for many pros and content creators in esports, the primary way they earn their income. You know, the, the thing I loved about your book, The Book of Esports, is how you brought us through each game and you saw the evolution of esports. And one of the games I want to talk about is, and it's the first one I heard, anything about associated with esports was the game World of Warcraft. How important was that game for the early esports community? Oh, I mean, I, I, World of Warcraft is humongous um, because, you know, my argument, and it's a little bit, you can pick a lot of games that would work for this. In the book, I, I give credit to listeners might know EverQuest or Ashburn Call or these other earlier MMOs. But World of Warcraft was really the first time you had large online communities forming around games that were stable and, and exerted influence into the real world. You know, the classic example of World of Warcraft is the number of marriages and divorces that came out of that game are incredible. <laughs> There's some statistic in the book, I forget the exact number, but it's like 10% of all divorces in the United Kingdom were partially attributed to World of Warcraft or wow. video games. You know, it was ridiculous. <laughs> The spouses were just playing so much World of Warcraft. It was such a different causal factor. And for people who were around during the wire, I mean, it was huge. It dominated people lives. And I think it got us comfortable as a society with real digital goods and digital prestige having value, right? I think mm -hmm. that's what World of Warcraft did because, like, being a guild master of a large, respected guild like in your game, that was something that came with adoration and accolades. And I even knew people at the time who would put that on a job resume. You know, they were proud of it. It showed they could organize large groups of people. And so World of Warcraft was a precursor of those community factors that I talked about in Scars. It was really the birth of online community. And, you know, I don't want to short World of Warcraft. It's an amazing success in its own right. It's still, I believe, the most popular MMO in the world. It speaks to World of Warcraft is a very good example of the other framework in the book, Omens, which predicts the success of games, um, which we can talk about if you want. But um, in terms of esports, it basically it, it showed the value of online communities to the world. I'm a novice to esports, and what I found fascinating was the important the game that I've really never heard of, and that was StarCraft. Why was that such an important game in the esports community and the growth of esports? Oh, man, you've never, you never heard of StarCraft. I, was no. really, yeah. Well, you know, StarCraft, for people who don't know, StarCraft is a real-time strategy game, okay. which basically involves controlling an army of about 200 units from a top-down 3D isometric perspective. And while you're controlling that army, you also have to build the base for the army, you have to harvest resources for the army, for that army, right? And so, as you can imagine, this gets really, really difficult to control because you're controlling 200 units, a base, resource harvesting, right? And so StarCraft, in many ways, was one of the highest skill cap multiplayer games of its time. It just took incredible amounts of proficiency to be good at. And even if you were good, you could keep getting really, really good. And so, you know, many gamers are probably listening to this podcast. That's probably the biggest thing they remember about playing StarCraft is just how hard it was to play and how talented you could get at it. But StarCraft matters to esports more than just it's a really difficult to play game that raised the skill ceiling for competitive titles. It also matters because around StarCraft, you've got a real proto esports scene in South Korea. And there are all sorts of reasons why 
Um, it started in South Korea, but essentially the scar factors were present there first. And so if you look in kind of, I forget, like earlier, you know, the, about, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when this game was building in popularity in Korea, right? Mm-hmm. People around the world were looking at South Korea and going, that country's so strange. Why would there be a pro gaming league on TV? Like what's happening? And the reality was South Korea wasn't strange at all. It was just early because of its sort of some of its unique geopolitical factors. It got the scars factors around gaming ahead of the rest of the world. And so it was kind of the canary in the coal mine for the phenomenon of global esports that was going to come. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I was interviewing the owner of a major fantasy sports platform. And one of his sections that you can play fantasy sports on was League of Legends, which was very surprising to me. Talk about League of Legends and how important was that in the evolution of esports? Well, you know, League of Legends is arguably the most popular esport in the world today. Um, So it's maybe the most important game of all right now for listeners to know. Um, and League of Legends is interesting because it sort of grows out of StarCraft, actually. Um, in fact, the problem that StarCraft has, if you imagine how I just described StarCraft to you, like, it's really difficult to control 200 plus units. As a new player, it's daunting, and I sort of quit, right? Like, I get frustrated. <laughs> I'm not thinking of somebody who's put thousands of hours into the game. I just, it's too difficult for me to follow what's going on. And so out of this RTS genre of games that StarCraft is a part of, you get what's called the MOBA genre, which stands for Massive Online Battle Arenas. And these essentially said, look, StarCraft, games of StarCraft are really fun, but what if you just had to control one unit as opposed to 200? So it'd be a lot easier. You could focus much more on just what this one unit is doing. We could have that unit gain levels and have more abilities, and we could try that. And these games, these MOBAs, actually started as mods within StarCraft. Um, and then they moved to Warcraft 3, and they became something called Dota that I'm sure many listeners are saying, you know, very, very familiar with. And I'm kind of glossing over the history here in the interest of time. But the point is, you had the MOBA genre born out of the RTS genre because it preserved a lot of the skill cap that vastly enhanced the accessibility, particularly for new players. And within the MOBA genre, Riot Games was really the first publisher to really effectively adopt a free-to-play business model, a microtransaction business model. We go back to that SAMS framework that I discussed earlier, right? And so this is what I mean about publishers leading innovation in the industry. They took a new genre of game. They applied, at the time, a relatively uncommon or less common monetization strategy to it. And as a result, they had an exploding player base, um, and they became the global esports phenomenon they are today. And yeah, I mean, if you don't know League of Legends, you should look. I mean, the LCS in some years gets more viewers than the Super Bowl. So it could arguably be the second largest sport in the world right now behind only uh, football or soccer, right? Or sorry, soccer. I use football in the European term. Absolutely. And, you know, one of esports that has been in the news lately and I hear a lot about is Overwatch and the Overwatch leagues. I mean, is that the wave of the future for esports when you look at Overwatch League? Is that what esports will become? So you're asking all all my favorite questions here, by the way. Um, But recall I sort of said earlier, look, there are two moments that really define modern esports and catalyze the birth of modern esports. One was Twitch, right? The other was the Overwatch League. And so for people who don't know or aren't familiar, the Overwatch League was the publisher of the game Overwatch. And Overwatch is what you would call a squad-based shooter, maybe, or a a lot of different terms. But essentially, you're a team of six heroes with fantastic powers. It's played from a first-person perspective, and you're shooting people with guns and things, but you also have these heroic abilities like flying or teleporting or yeah, it's a very cool game. Um, and the game was very, very popular, you know, post launch blizzard knew they had a pre launch blizzard knew they had a hit on their hands. And so they made a decision. They said, we really, really want to lean into the competitive scene here and we want to actually sell franchises. So just like the NFL or, you know, the MLB where you can buy a city based franchise for Boston or New York and gain exclusive rights around that geography. Activision Blizzard decided they would do that for Overwatch. And overnight, that was really the moment when modern esports was born. And that happened because now, as a team, right, you think about sports, teams are really important. Previously, I kind of struggled 
to make money and have a reliable permanence mm-hmm. around my income stream. Right, yeah. because I could hire my players and build a great squad, but my squad was only as valuable as the players on it. Their contracts would lapse or be bought out, and there was nothing protecting my space in the league. So if somebody else came in with more money and said, "I want to, you know, pay your players double," they could just force me out. But all of a sudden, this franchising created permanent rights. And if you think about sports, permanency is the key. Mm-hmm. Because you need to know, like, if look, look at, let's say I want to devote myself to a baseball career. I start with a little league, I might play college ball, then I go to the minor leagues, all of that to finally get into major league baseball, right? If I'm lucky. Now, I have to have faith that whole time that major league baseball is going to be there, right? It's not just going to swap to major league cricket or major league hula hoop or something crazy, right? You know, and we just trust that sports are permanent. But esports weren't like that. Games were shooting over here. Think about how many Mario titles a casual listener can name, right? Yeah. Um, but the overall thing created this permanence for the team, and it put a flag down for permanence in the space. And it said, this game is going to stick around. And real respected sports franchise owners, because a lot of major sports franchise owners bought into this, were willing to pay $20 million or more for those rights. So this had real value. And that signaling kicked off the modern gold rush in esports. Did Overwatch League also symbolize the time when esports was trying to transition into a spectator sport? I mean, was that the intention of Overwatch League? And is that how they sold it to sponsors that were now becoming a spectator sport? A hundred percent. If you think of where you were in that BAMS framework, you're sort of at a microtransaction stage at that point. Most publishers were interested in how do we give the game away for free or at a low cost and make as much money as we can on selling you incremental upgrades in the game. That was the hot new business model. And the Overwatch League said, no, we can get franchise revenue for the publisher. I can get teams to pay me 20 million a pop. That adds up quickly. I can sell advertising. I can sell sponsorships. The teams can sell advertising and sponsorships. We can do local events. And, you know, some of this was already happening before. I, I don't want to say that the over, like, all of this suddenly came into existence because the Overwatch League. This was a gradual trend. But the size and scale of the Overwatch League and the permanent rights it granted, it transitioned esports from a cost center from the publishers, basically a marketing expense, putting on these tournaments in the hopes that people would buy more copies of the game and buy more things in the game. It turned it from a marketing expense into a revenue center because now – the act of throwing competitive activities could just be profitable in and of itself, right? Mm-hmm. Look at the, I think the most recent deal Activision Blizzard did was a $100 million deal with, $100 million deal with YouTube for exclusive rights to the Overwatch League for three years. And I think some other leagues, Call of Duty and Hearthstone along with it, right? So that's a lot of money, you know, even for a big company like Activision Blizzard. And so that was the moment, you know, again, Overwatch League is just so important for what it's done for the space. Um, and that was the moment when publishers were like, hey, I don't just have to spend money on this. I can make money. Advertising and assets is a way we can monetize games. And that's where we are today. We're in this process of discovering all the different ways games can monetize without ever asking a player to spend a dollar on anything related to the game. How much pressure did that put on uh, game publishers? I mean, they have to create a game that's fun to play, but also now fun to watch. I mean, I keep thinking of the example of poker. I know a lot of people who like playing poker, but I also know a lot of people who can't stand watching it on TV. I mean, how much did this change the business of game development? Well, you know, the short answer is not enough, right? I think publishers are still grappling with the fact that games don't just have to be fun for players anymore, they have to be fun for viewers. And I think the success or failure of many of these other leagues that have come into being um, post-Overwatch League, and even including the Overwatch League, is really largely driven by the fact that (laughs) these games, well, they might be an absolute blast as a single-player experience. They're a nightmare to watch from a third party, right? They're not set up to be wonderful viewing experiences, so to be wonderful playing experiences. And what that's teaching the industry right now is you can't just take a competitive multiplayer game and say it's going to be a hot esport because the reality is unless the viewership experience is there, sponsors don't want to be there, advertisers don't want to be there because viewers don't want to be there, right? And so I think the industry is still grappling with all the implications of how game design has to change. And I think... Some games got partially lucky, like League of Legends, going back to that. The decision that it made early to focus on one hero to increase the accessibility for new players also vastly increases the accessibility and clarity for viewers. 
but also to Riot Games' credit, they have made many, many business decisions since then to optimize the viewing experience of League, not just the playing experience. So they clearly understand as a publisher, and they're part of really the vanguard in this regard, they, they really understand that it's not just about playing the game, it's about watching. You know, like you said, the leagues like the Overwatch League are modeling themselves after other professional organizations like the NFL, the NBA, the MLB. Will esports players be modeling themselves after players in these leagues? Will we start seeing esport player unions where the where there'll be uh, collective bargaining agreements? Oh, what do you see as the future for esport players? Well, this is a really interesting question because. This is where, you know, one thing I always sort of caution people about is, okay, you know, this parallel between esports and traditional sports, right? Mm -hmm. You have to be careful because it does apply much of the time, but the times it doesn't apply, it really does not apply, right? And I think the case of player lifestyle and player experience is one where the traditional sports paradigms probably don't apply. Um, and let me give you an example, but before I do, let me just say something like player unions, that, that will exist. And in fact, it does. There have been organizations okay. like PIA that I think stand for the professional esport or the pro esports association or something that have come into being that have tried to aggregate player rights. And I think we're going to see more of that moving forward for sure. But the big difference between being a pro gamer today and being a pro athlete is you know, let's use an example of somebody I know, like, you know, Tom Brady, right? The quarterback, right? Because I'm from New England. Although I guess maybe I shouldn't be such a Tom Brady fan now that he, <laughs> he's a cat. But anyway, um, right? Like, when did I actually see Tom Brady? I saw him in games and I saw him in commercials. And that's about it, right? That was it. So my exposure to Tom Brady was basically NFL games, essentially. NFL advertising. Now, think about esports pros. If you're a popular gamer like, you know, Shroud, you might be streaming yourself playing four hours a day, five hours a day, eight hours a day. That is a completely different fan engagement experience with the athlete, right? It is completely different because you're inside their lives. You're basically, these people could be a permanent part of your evening, right? For many people, they tune into somebody like, you know, Shroud or Dr. Disrespect, and that's what they're going to do for their entertainment in the evening. So in that regard, esports pros, behave almost more like um, Instagram influencers or social media influencers or even TV shows than they do professional athletes. And that's actually a divide in the industry, too, because if you think about being an esports pro and having a choice, right, you can stream and get your streaming revenues, right, which are very lucrative and very reliable, or let's say you have a big tournament coming up and you want to practice, but you want to practice in secret. You don't want to show the other teams your strategies or the heroes you're working on. And, you know, because like that is a huge advantage, right? So the more competitive you are as a player, the more streaming becomes difficult to integrate into your lifestyle. And the more you have to sacrifice some of these streaming opportunity revenues for the chance at competitive revenues. And where the industry nets out on how that trade-off makes sense is going to be really interesting to see because I don't think it's settled today. Some pros say, I just love competition. I'm a full-time pro. Other pros drop out and say, I earn way more money streaming than I do maybe sometimes winning tournaments. Um, but in that regard, again, esports pros are totally different in terms of how they behave in market than I think professional sports stars. How are pro esport players recruited? I mean, I'm very curious about that. I mean, I've read stories that there are going to be esport drafts. There, uh, I read a story also there might be an esports combine, much like the NFL combine in Indianapolis. But how are these players recruited onto these professional teams? Well, you know, lots of different ways. Um, sometimes with networks, you just know players. Sometimes analytics, um, but you know, more and more of the industry is professionalizing. Like you said, combine, right? Like, you know, I'll just give you a direct, there is a combine. For example, the NBA launched the NBA 2K League, which is their, you know, um, you know, their sort of digital version of basketball that they're building a competitive esport around. And the NBA, for the past three years, has had a combine, literally. Yeah. Like, they've had a combine for players to show their stuff and qualify and go through, right? And many, many other leagues have now minor league systems, like the Overwatch League has the Challenger League system, right? So this structure, what's kind of unusual about esports is for sports, 
we built the recruiting and sort of we built we built it from the bottom up, right? I think like you know first you were playing with friends, then maybe the friends organized into regional leagues, then the regional leagues became you know um, national, and then the national leagues kind of conflicted like in baseball and eventually merged together, right? So we kind of built the top professional scene from the bottom up. But in esports, because we sort of knew what sports looked like, we started at the very top. We're like, we're going world championship, you know, <laughs> United States championship, like major national, right? But the infrastructure under it, which a lot of that is training and recruiting, really didn't exist. And so that's partly what's being built now. And that's why you're seeing more formal solutions coming to the market in terms of professionalized player recruitment. But we still have a long way to go there as an industry. How does leagues and developers know that a game will be successful and maintain an audience for a long time? I mean, for example, Fortnite, I mean, that is such a great game for a lot of people. I mean, how did that maintain such a loyal following? Well, that's my last framework. Well, not the last, but that's another framework from the book, the Owens framework, because this is a really interesting question. And one of the big things that kind of propelled me to write this book is, why did some games stick around <laughs> and other games not, right? Yeah. And that is like a really central question for all the reasons I sort of said earlier about uh, about permanence in sport, right? Like, if you love the game, you need to have confidence it's going to exist if you're going to try to become a professional in it. And so the only framework is basically arguing these are the five factors that games need to display to continue to be successful and to compound on their success. Um, and they stand for options for competition, monetization, ecosystem, network effects, and subscription costs. And I promise, guys, this is a lot more exciting in the book. I'll have a lot of fun reading about this. Cool, there's great examples. But for the purposes of this, the publishers that do these elements well or better and improve them over time stick around. And Fortnite is a great example of a publisher that at launch had essentially none of these elements, saw what was happening in market, fast corrected the course, and today is you know, arguably still the most popular esport in the world. Um, so if you think about Fortnite, when it launched, it wasn't even a Battle Royale game. For people who don't know, Battle Royales are essentially 100-person free-for-alls. You drop, you know, usually by air in some form onto an island or a tropical paradise or a space station or something, and you, you know, go crazy and like you kind of have to get everybody else killed. And if you're the last person standing, you win, right? So that's a battle royale game. It's a play from a first or a third person perspective, like a lot of traditional shooters you might remember. Um, and when Fortnite launched, it wasn't even battle royale. It was this kind of like zombie defense game. And at the time, there was an incredibly popular game that had invented the Battle Royale genre, PUBG, which stood for Player Unknown Battlegrounds and Market. And it was just exploding, right? Like exploding. I mean, it was beating every major mar milestone for a monthly active players, for installs. It was crazy. Um, and the Fortnite guys, you know, in the publisher Epic Games looked and said, well, wait a minute. Let's take some elements from that. Let's relaunch Fortnite as a battle royale. That was their first decision. But then they started to do all these other fascinating decisions to compound the success of the game. For example, uh, Fortnite has a unique building mechanic where you actually build and assemble structures on the fly out of materials you harvest. And you think of a 100-person free-for-all game, right? Mm -hmm. um, like uh, like uh, PUBG in this example, right? Like you just get killed randomly a lot. You're going around and somebody shoots you from across the map that you weren't looking, it's very chaotic. But the fact that you can build these structures in the game in Fortnite eliminates a lot of that chaos. It allows you to control, skill players to control the environment around them, right? And to manipulate it to their advantage, to protect against ambushes, to get height when they wouldn't otherwise have height, to build defenses against grenades, you know, all of this stuff. And so that's one example where they took the PUBG formula, they changed it, and they made it a much stronger and more and a stickier game for users. Um, and that particular example I'm giving at the building mechanics raised the switching cost of the game. And a switching cost is basically when you trade games, you get to keep everything you have from the game when you go to the new game. And shooters have relatively high switching costs because all of them sort of play the same. You have a gun, you have to track targets, you know, and hit them in the, you know, vulnerable positions or vulnerable parts of their body or skeleton, right? Mm -hmm. But 
building was so unique to Fortnite. If you got really good at building and you went to another game, that still did not transfer. So you were wasting hours you had in Fortnite because there was nothing else like it in market. Nothing else had this unique sort of building system. And so that's just one example, but there's literally dozens of how Fortnite kind of rethought the Battle Royale genre and turned what was really a dead on arrival launch title into the largest Battle Royale game today and completely dethroned PUBG. And in the process, I think, showed a really clear blueprint to how publishers can design their games for long-term success. You know, another thing I'm seeing about esports is colleges and universities are becoming more involved with esports. I mean, even some are offering scholarship to players. Can you tell us a little bit about what colleges and universities are doing, and do you think more schools will become involved with esports in the future? Oh, oh my gosh. I mean, if there's a renaissance moment right now in esports, it's college university adoption. It is through the roof right now for esports. And there's a whole chapter in the book about this. I mean, I mentioned before, like, I, you know, you got interested in writing the book so that to teach the college. I couldn't believe it. I was like, there's a college that wants me to teach about competitive video games. Like, sure, you know. Um, but why this is exploding in college is really, you know, two primary reasons. One is it's just what college students want to do, right? Like, colleges exist to serve their student body. And so... So many kids of college age today, you know, 18 to 21, are, you know, gamers. I think the fact that it's basically like 50%. And a surprisingly fair gender split for it as well, fairer than you might expect, right? So if you have half of your student body logging in to play League of Legends or Rainbow Six Siege or Rocket League every night, as an administration, you're going to take notice because clubs are going to form, students are going to request. And if you're in the business of keeping your students happy, you're going to realize, hey, there might be something here with esports just from a student demand perspective. But the other reason it's important is because of the same reasons we value traditional athletics, right? They build engagement, they build school pride, and eventually alumni donations. And the reality is esports has all of those same benefits. They build the same affiliation. People become, you know, people, schools with strong esports programs. It actually becomes a defining mark of the school. You can look at uh, Robert Mar. Ars University, RMU, um, about, you know, as an example of that, where it really took over the identity of the institution in some regards, in a positive way, by the way. I don't mean a negative. Um, and, you know, by the way, the students who are playing esports are maybe not the same people, or at least some of them aren't the same people who are, you know, participating in traditional sports and getting the benefits that way. And they're maybe not the same people showing up for band practice. So it's sort of an incremental student body you know, elements as well that can be brought into the fold and give all of these benefits back to the institution. So I think because of those and other reasons, this is like the next, basically this next five-year period in the esports is going to partially be defined by how fast colleges adopt them. And it is crazy. You know, I think you're going to see 100% of schools with esports programs before the end of the decade. It's like that big and happening that fast. You know, one of the things in the news about esports is that some states are allowing people to bet on certain tournaments. And I know casinos are taking a hard look on how they can become involved with esports. Do you think allowing betting on esports will help esports, or you think esports shouldn't be involved with the sports betting world? You know, I think I, leaving sort of personal opinion aside, I just think I'd say, look, like, you know, things like fantasy sports and wagering have just been so important to the evolution of traditional sports, right? Like, we just had the, we just had the DraftKings IPO, right? Didn't we? And it was like a crazy success, you oh, know? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, like, it's just such an element of the ecosystem for traditional sports. I think it's something that is just going to have to be an element of the ecosystem in esports because fundamentally, esports esports are going to behave the same way from a viewer experience. You're going to watch at home. You're going to become passionate about certain players. You're going to get into the stats and the numbers behind them. And that all leads to things like DraftKings. So we will have it for esports. It will be huge. Um, you know, and I think it's, it's that that is one of the other, you know, it's like college and university. I think the wagering market is the other thing that's going to be a massive, massive growth opportunity for the industry going forward. William, we're running out of time, but uh, can you tell people how they can get a copy of your great book, The Book of Esports? Well, thank you so much for asking. Yes. So the book is called The Book of Esports. Um, that's hopefully very easy to remember. Uh, <laughs> and you can get it literally wherever books are sold, you know, Amazon, um, 
you know, Barnes and Noble, you know, any of the, you know, other online listing sites. Amazon is the one I usually recommend to go to. And it's available in all the formats. It has a hardcover edition, which is my favorite because it looks gorgeous on a shelf. It has an audio book, which is actually narrated by me. So if you didn't get bored hearing my voice <laughs> during this interview, you can hear me read it. Uh, you know, the audiobook version, it has an ebook, you know, all the popular formats. So definitely check it out. The book has, you know, I've just been stunned by sort of how well it performed and the positive response to it. Um, and if you're hearing about it for the first time, like, please check it out and give it a read because I promise there's a lot more interesting facts in it than I shared in this brief conversation. And I also promise it is a really fun read. Like, you will enjoy it. I wrote something that would work for casuals, but as a hardcore gamer myself, you know, there is a lot in there if you've been gaming like me since the original Nintendo. So check it out and enjoy. William Collis, author of The Book of Esports. Thanks so much for coming on and telling us all about the world of esports. It's such an exciting and growing field of sports that I'm sure people are going to learn more about through your excellent book. And it was such a fun read. I, I read it so quickly and I enjoyed every bit of it. Thanks so much for letting us know about it. Thank you. It was a real pleasure to be here. Stick around. We'll be right back with more Turnpike Sports. <laughs> Free stuff is awesome, but free stuff that will spice up your bedroom is even better. Just go to adamandeve.com and select almost any one item for 50% off, and then we'll load on the free stuff. Just enter this very exclusive code, BABE16, at checkout, and you'll get 10 tantalizing free gifts, including a sexy item for him, a special toy for her, and a third item you'll both enjoy, and Six extra special bonus items that are sure to rev your engine, pique your curiosity, mm. and even blow you away. Plus, free shipping. Always sent in discreet packaging. Go to adamandeve.com now. Get 50% off plus the 10 free gifts when you enter the exclusive offer code BABE16. That's BABE16. Because without it, no, no free stuff. stuff. That's BABE16 at adamandeve.com. Sometimes life is wonderful, and sometimes it's not. Cherish the good, but always be prepared for life's challenges. At Private Healthcare, we provide the peace of mind you deserve. With Private Healthcare, you'll get the coverage you want and healthcare you need. If your employer doesn't supply healthcare coverage and you don't qualify for Medicare or Medicaid, you need to give us a call right now. Private health care is private health insurance for ages 65 and under with medical, dental, vision, and even prescription coverage. When life comes at you unexpectedly, you need to be ready, and health insurance is your financial safety net. If you're looking for health coverage at the best price and your annual household income is 35000 or more, give us a call at 800-231-9279. That's 800-231-9279. 800-231-9279. The Turnpike Sports Pro Football Pick segment is brought to you by William Hill in New Jersey. Football is back, and William Hill is celebrating the 2020 season with a great new welcome offer in New Jersey. Sign up with William Hill Online Sportsbook in New Jersey using our promo code PIKE500 to receive a bet up to $500 with your first deposit of $50 or more. That's promo code PIKE500 for a free bet up to $500 with your first deposit of $50 or more at William Hill in New Jersey. Must be 21 years or older and in New Jersey. Terms and conditions apply. New customers only. Problem gambler? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. All right. This is coming up here. We got week five. Yep. Um, actually, I think we said at the top of the show, you did pretty good. 3-0. and I did 2-1. and uh, Season series right now, you're 7-5. and five. I still have a game lead, 8-4. and four. Okay. All right. It's and, close. And as always, uh, for the pick segment, we use William Hill lines right now. Yep. Uh, and uh, these picks will be put up on the Turnpike Sports blog 
after the show is published, head on over to turnpikesportsradio.com. Click on the blog button. They'll be there. You can actually comment on the blog. You can email us at info at turnpikesportsradio.com uh, or hit us up on our social media handles at Turnpike Sports on Facebook and Twitter at Turnpike Sports Radio over on Instagram. And how this segment works is we each pick three games, either by the spread or by the over-under, the totals. And uh, we just, uh, each week, it's three games. And uh, we just uh, see how we do. Yeah, and we don't talk to each other before this, so I don't know what games you're picking. You don't know what games I'm picking. And uh, I guess sometimes we overlap, but (laughs) usually we don't. Well, last week you went first. I'll go first this week. Okay. First game, Tampa Bay Buccaneers favored by five and a half over the Chicago Bears, and the over-under is 44. You know, when I say we usually don't pick the same games, and of course you picked the same game as I did. So uh, we both have an al- analysis on this one, so go ahead. I'll, I'll go right after you. Well, I, I've been watching the Buccaneers here and there uh, since the beginning of the season, and they have been playing better as the season has progressed. Well, Tom Brady's getting comfortable. Uh, the offense is getting more cohesive. Yep. He threw five touchdowns against a really good Chargers team. Yeah, five touchdowns to five different receivers. Yep. So uh, very impressive. And one of the things I noticed that is flying under the radar to a certain extent is the Tampa Bay defense is playing very well. And I think everyone's focused on Bruce Arians' new toys on the offensive side, especially with Brady and a lot of the other guys they brought over when uh, Brady signed. But that defense is is the key. And the the defense was keeping them in games last year when Jameis Winston was throwing 30 interceptions. Um, I, I just uh, think right now they're going into Chicago. Chicago's 3-1. and one. They're led by Nick Foles. I'm not sold on Chicago as a good, solid 3-1 and one team. Tampa Bay's four and one against the spread of the last five games on the road. The Bears are four and twelve in their last against the spread in their last sixteen overall. I just think Tampa Bay is going to be too much for the Chicago Bears. I'm going with Tampa Bay. Well, I like your uh, philosophy. I like your analysis on the game. Uh, yet I even have it written down. You'll see it on the blog. I think I'll take the Buccaneers laying the points, but that's not my official pick. Tom, Like you said, Tom Brady threw five touchdowns to five different receivers. The over-under is 44. Really? Come on. And the Bears are playing at home. So you know what? I'm taking the over in this one. Well, that's what you did last time, too. Uh, yeah, last no, week no, was three no. overs. I, no, no, no. I had two overs, and I forgot what the other one was. <laughs> I did the two overs. Wait, Seattle. Wait. I, t- I did, yeah. Seattle, you did the points. Yeah, I did uh, points in Seattle. Okay, so uh, that was last week, but uh, but Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Chicago Bears. I'm taking the over over, over 44. 44. I don't know exactly why that's 44. I think that is a little low. Well, look, I, I think Nick Foles was better than what he showed last week. So um, see, yeah. I don't think so. Well, you yeah. know. Anyway, next game: Philadelphia Eagles at the Pittsburgh Steelers. Steelers are favored by seven. There's an over under of 45. This is the battle of Pennsylvania. Uh, Steelers are actually sitting atop the AFC North. They're three and three and zero. Oh. They had the unexpected COVID buy, so yep, they're yep. looking for going forward to going four and zero. Oh. I think uh, while the Eagles are in first place, they're one two <laughs> and one in a, in a really bad that NFC. That is East. so strange. They won their first game and they're already in first place. Really? It, it, it's yeah. actually kind of surprising. I thought the NFC East was going to be a little bit better than it is, but really, it's. Not a really good division, and uh, the Eagles actually got their first win by outplaying a 49ers team that was devastated by injuries, too. Sure. Uh, I just think, uh, To know, be fair, though, Philly was devastated by injuries as well. They, they had really no wide receivers. No, but whatsoever. still, they had, they, they, had all, they had Carson Wentz. Oh, the Niners okay. did not. They didn't have Garoppolo. You know, they had Mullins over there who actually lit them up. So uh, I, I think Pittsburgh has too many uh, weapons for Philly. The over is 5-1 and one in the Eagles' last six road games, and the Steelers really do have a lot of weapons on offense, both running and throwing. And the over-under is 45, and I'm picking the over in this game. All right, my next game is the Indianapolis Colts, favored by 2.5 versus the Cleveland Browns with an over-under of 47. I I even have it written down in my notes. How about the Cleveland Browns beating the Dallas Cowboys? I think that was the first time since 1994, was it? I saw that on TV. Yeah. Now, look, the loss of Nick Chubb hurts, but I don't think it diminishes the chances of the Browns keeping this one close. And you know what? I think they might even win this one. 
The Colts are two and five against the spread in their last seven games as a road favorite, and I thinking that trend is going to continue. I think the Browns are on a roll, so I'm picking the home dog this week. I'm going with the underdog Cleveland Browns. For my last game, I chose that game. Oh, okay. Um, Colts going into uh, Cleveland again, two and a half favorite. Colts are three and one. They look really, really good. I think they did. Uh, Philip Rivers seems to be almost like it looks like he's always been there with that Colts offense running so well. He's been throwing all different receivers. Their defense, the Colts defense, is actually playing extremely well. And uh, I think the Browns really wanted that Dallas game a lot because they emptied the playbook. They were doing trick play (laughs) after trick play. And I think that's a little deceiving because Dallas is not as good as the Colts. I think the Colts are going to be better prepared for all the trick plays and the gadgetry because they just watched it all. Uh, in previous week against the Cowboys. Am I hearing this right? Are we going head to head on this yep. one? Indianapolis right. Indianapolis is 4 and 2 against the spread in their last 6 games and the Browns are 2 and 5 against the spread in their last 7. Okay. So it shows you we can look at stats different ways here. We found stats that support our arguments here. I'm going with the Colts favored by 2 and a half. Okay. And my last game is the Los Angeles Rams who are 8 point favorites versus the Washington football team with an over under of 45. The first thing I saw was the relatively low total in this game, and I wanted to take a look at what the both these teams were doing. When it, when it comes to the over-under, the L.A. Rams are 5-2 and two hitting the over. Now, with regard to the Washington football teams, in the last seven games, they hit the over six of those games. So I'm going with the trend. I mean, the, the books are giving me a low number for the over-under. So you know what? I'm taking the over because you know what? Both these teams seem to be hitting the over a lot. That's a good trend to follow right there. Yep. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm still not used to saying Washington football team. Washington football team. Is it Washington? It's not football club. That'd be soccer. No, no, no. I think yeah. that's soccer. Close enough to being <laughs> a soccer, be soccer team. So. But uh, Washington has looked good at times. Uh, their defense, I think, is very good. Yeah, their very offense is, is the question mark there. They're still going to go yeah. over in this game. <laughs> well, uh, summarize. I did the uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers five and a half points favorite. I did the over forty five in the Eagles Steelers game, and I picked the Colts two and a half favorites over the Browns. I picked the over in the Tampa Bay Chicago game over forty four in the Indianapolis Colts and the Cleveland Brown game. I'm taking the underdog Cleveland Browns. And in the Los Angeles Rams versus the Washington football team, I'm taking the over 45. All right, and all these picks will be put up onto the Turnpike Sports blog after this show is published. Uh, Go over to turnpikesportsradio.com, click on the blog button, you'll see them there. We'll also post them up on social media as well before uh, Sunday's games uh, and Thursday's game. Uh, so uh, we will uh, await your comments from there, info at turnpikesportsradio.com, or you can uh, put them up on the comment section in the blog or hit us up on uh, social media, Twitter and Facebook, at Turnpike Sports, at Turnpike Sports Radio on Instagram. The Turnpike Sports Book Report is up next, so stick around. We'll be right back with more Turnpike Sports. Tax Solutions Now is a complimentary referral service that connects callers to companies that provide tax services. Money matters. If you owe thousands in back taxes to the IRS, how much can Tax Solutions Now save you? I paid less than I owe. That's right. Money matters. So call Tax Solutions Now and get the IRS off your back. Since 2014, Tax Solutions Now has been a leader in the tax resolution industry. Remove wage garnishments, property liens, fines, and penalties. Qualify for the Fresh Start program or even uncollectible status. How much can Tax Solutions Now save you? I owed the IRS over $10,000. I paid a fraction of what I owed. Call now to reduce or even eliminate your back taxes. I called Tax Solutions Now and got the IRS off my back. Thanks. You saved us a ton of money. Money matters. How much can Tax Solutions Now save you call now and find out call 800-683-7377 800-683-7377 800-683-7377 the 
Turnpike Sports Book Report. Got a couple sets of numbers to uh, start off this week's uh, Turnpike Sports Book Report. We have uh, Nevada reporting a record handle for the month of August. Now, is this a record handle for the state or national? Record handle for the state. State, okay. They brought in, or they had a handle of $475.1 million statewide. All right. That's a sixty, just under a 65% increase over a year over year in August. All-time record for the month of August in, in Nevada. Mobile sports wagering accounted for 64% of the total bets made which is nice to see that number growing. They're still one of the few states that st- have the in-person registration on the books. That's why it's so low compared to other states. I mean, we're seeing New Jersey and Pennsylvania like 90% online betting, and, and this is, what, almost 65% yep. online? Wow. Yep. Well, you've you got to remember, we're still seeing a lot of people not going to Vegas that they normally would be going to Vegas and Nevada in general because of COVID. No, no, no. I, I'm saying it's it's interesting that Nevada hasn't have doesn't have a large online betting right I'm, as the other. Uh, and what yeah. I'm saying is the out the visitors who actually bet with their apps when they go to Vegas aren't there. You may be seeing an effect by that too. So uh, I'm just saying there's a whole bunch of different reasons why it's still low. The in person registration is the main reason. Um, they had $17 million in revenue. Well, you, you think it's the main reason. They haven't given no. that statement no. like that. Right? I think it's the main reason. Okay. Uh, $17 million in revenue, which is a 9.3% decline from a year ago. So uh, they're still showing the effect of the uh, virus because of their uh, sports betting numbers. But the sports betting numbers were better than the overall gaming numbers in terms of overall uh, performance okay. in the state. Delaware brought in a handle of seven point three million dollars. We haven't heard from Delaware in a long time. No, you know, no. it's interesting. You brought up Delaware, but it's uh, interesting. They had a thirty eight percent year on year decline for the month of August, but they had a hundred and forty percent increase month on month from July to August. They had an increase, one hundred and forty three percent. Revenue was about nine hundred thousand dollars. That's down almost sixty percent from the two point two million dollars in September of last year. Okay. Uh, monthly total was 146% higher than the $367,000 recorded in August as well. So they went higher month to month, uh, decline year to year, just like everybody else has been showing. Uh, Rhode Island. Okay. <laughs> this, this, is, uh, this is one of the few states that has shown an increase both year on year and also month to month. Rhode Island brought in a handle of $23 million in August. That's up almost 245% from July and also up 117% from August of last year. So they've actually shown growth mm-hmm. in terms of sports betting revenue and also sports betting, betting handle uh, because they dropped the in-person requirement. Uh, as I said, they had year-on-year increases everywhere. Their revenue for the month of August was $1.4 million. That's a 64%, almost 65% year-on-year rise from this time from that month last year uh let's see also they had a rise in revenue of almost 300 percent from the previous month from july to august they had almost 300 percent revenue increase okay over in pennsylvania we have and i think we're going to be getting this week to week here because they're trying to tout the numbers and the growth barstool the barstool sports sports book brought in a handle of 12 and a half million dollars in their second weekend in operation that's up 14% from the $11 million it took in in the first weekend. All right. Uh, interesting number is the number of registrations. 95% of their registrations were new to Pennsylvania's database. So they brought in a whole bunch of new players to the Pennsylvania sports betting scene. Well, they, they bring in a built-in fan base. I mean, Barstool Sports is very popular. It's a great it's a great platform. It's They have great guests and hosts and things like that. So, you know, they have that built-in audience that they can bring to their sports book. I mean, that's, that's what I mean. I, I can't wait for them to get to New Jersey, if they ever get to New Jersey. I hope they do. Well, they're going to be expanding. Their, they have targeted several other states. So uh, what's also interesting uh, let's see, 24,000 of the 30,000 app downloads in Pennsylvania have led to registrations, which is unusual. That's a good turnover. You know, it's interesting. Wait, 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 wait. It's, it's, say that again. That, that's that's interesting to me. 24,000 of the 30,000 people that downloaded the yeah. app 
yeah. have also registered and completed their registration. I mean, that's interesting that there's a number out there that people download the app but don't register. That they had that in Rhode Island for, that's, for a that's long, weird. long that's time. That's weird to me. Why would you download an app and not register? Because you can't get to the casino to finish up some of these things. And also, some people download the app, and there's some functionality to it without doing any betting. So they're downloading the app for Some the maybe are. informational purposes exactly. and things like that? Exactly. No, that's interesting to me, that you would download a sports book app and not register for it. That's that's very interesting to me. Well, you got you got to realize, states like Rhode Island, when they had the in-person registration, yeah. they were only converting maybe half of those, if not less, okay. to, to full registrations. All right. Um, also, the average deposit was $243 by uh, the customers. All right. And of the eleven million dollars bet in the first weekend of operation, twenty-two percent of that handle came on bets that were promoted by the barstool personalities online or wherever they were promoting them. So I, I haven't seen the barstool app yet or anything like that. Are, are you saying that the barstool personalities have their, you know, their their featured pick kind of thing, or they sort have like of a like fe- that? And also, I haven't seen that they're yet. also all over Twitter. Okay, yeah. Putting a bet here, and they say, promote this, we're doing a special okay, here. Okay, all right. And 22% of the overall handle of that first weekend was on the promo bets. Yeah, no, I know. I saw uh, Fox Bet does that, you know, especially on their uh, TV show. What, what is it called now? The Fox Bet Live. Fox Bet Live. Used to be Lock It In. But, you know, they have uh, Uncle Sal's special kind of thing, and they're 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 touting that. But, uh, no, I, I, mean, I guess Barstool does it, too. So. Wait, you, right. you also got to realize now this season with Fox Bet, you're going to have Howie Long doing it. Yeah, yeah, so, no. Uh, Who is it? Howie Long and uh, is Terry Bradshaw doing anything like part that? Of, he, d- he does a lot of the stuff with the free to play game. Okay, that yeah, they no, do on I, TV. I saw them talking about their free to play app kind of thing. Yeah. So yeah, okay. So All whenever right. you see the free to play games, you're going to see Terry okay. Bradshaw and Howie Long. But Howie so, Long is going to be promoting the betting too. So what you're saying, those things work marketing wise, right? They work. They okay. They, they work, work for a time. Okay. <laughs> At some point, you're going to see some of that right. drop off. But yeah, it's uh, they do work. All right. Over in Indiana, we had ESPN and the National Football Post register as sports betting uh, vendors. The National Football Post, yeah. What is that's it? still around? That's a, that's wow. an old, that's an old publication. I know. I I, I you know. Okay. But they registered as sports betting affiliates sites. Wow. It's so nice, nice to hear they're still around. They're moving into that. Okay. Which is nice. Over that's over in Indiana. Uh, over in New Jersey, we had the German sportsbook operator Tipica. Uh, they got their uh, uh, conditional approval for launch in New Jersey last week. Great, great. And uh, they actually had a little uh, story on them in uh, one of the business magazines uh, in New Jersey that they're planning on growing their their employee numbers in New Jersey. That's going to be their main headquarters. Great, great. Uh, Hoboken's office right now they have five players, uh, five uh, employees. They're going to uh, grow that, and they hope to have at least maybe. 40, 50, 60 by the end of this year Great. in Hoboken, New Jersey. So it's in Hoboken, right? Hoboken. It seems like they're all in North Jersey. Didn't you go to a meeting? West, uh, West. Uh, you went to West New York, New Jersey. By the way, that's the actual to, city's name. It's West New York, New Jersey. I, I mean, it's uh, Well, you got to realize. It's a very, very odd name for a city in New Jersey. You've got Jersey City, Hoboken, West New York. West New York is where a lot of the media companies have their headquarters because they don't want to be in New York, but they have them headquarters in West New West New York, New Jersey. Yep. Like the NBA is there. Mm-hmm. The NBA has stuff there, and it, it that's where all the media companies pretty much gravitate to because it's it's right near New York, but it's in New Jersey. Yeah, it, it's strange. I, New Jersey's home to a lot of what you think would be New York companies. I mean, th- there's a headquarters Dow Jones on Route yep. One. <laughs> So it's, uh, you know, when you think of a company that's typically New York, you know, usually they have their headquarters somewhere else and probably in New Jersey because, let's be honest, the taxes are a little better. Yeah. And, you know, and it's you can have uh, bigger buildings because you're spread out a little more. And there's also sports betting in New Jersey, not yeah, New York. Yeah, well, there's that. Yeah. Um, we have two, uh, two deals to talk about. Well, actually, one deal, one launch. Over, okay. over in Illinois, we have the Hawthorne Race Course. And points bet sportsbook finally opening. It's the closest in person sportsbook to the city of Chicago. You know everything's inching closer to Chicago, which is nice. You know that that I can't wait for like just a sportsbook right in the center of Chicago, which would be great, or a big casino and a couple of casinos in They're Chicago. They're trying. They're and, trying. You know, it'd be. I love going to Philadelphia because they have their casinos right in town. 
You know, well, they have the one big one, which yeah. is it used to be Sugar House. It's Rivers uh, Casino Philly, and they just River. celebrated their tenth year anniversary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Congratulations to I them. I think it's their first year as Rivers, yeah. but they're ten years old. Then a little south of Philadelphia, there's Harris. They used to call it Harris Chester, but now they call it Harris Philadelphia. Yeah. But, and a little north of that, they have parks. So yep. everything's pretty. And now Live Philadelphia is going to be built. That's I, the I know the first they, one's in Pittsburgh. The fir- well, yeah, the first one's in Pittsburgh, but you know, there, it looks like next year they're going to open up live Philadelphia. That would be live interesting. Philly, it, I guess it's and called. It's in, near all the stadiums too. Yes, yeah, very close to the stadium. So, um, but uh, the Hawthorne Racecourse is the first of four Chicago Land locations that the two companies are going to be opening. Three of them are going to OTB it. Uh, the current one has over sixty uh, high definition TVs, twenty self service kiosks a three-person betting concierge counter, and uh, they also have a VIP lounge. Okay. Now, that's going to be replaced soon when the new Hawthorne Resort and Casino opens up on that property. They're doing a $400 million casino development project, and it's going to be a really high-end-looking casino in that area. Okay. Uh, over in, uh, Still hanging out in Illinois, we have Twin River. <laughs> now, we were just talking about Rhode Island, where Twin River really started from. Uh, they just bought the... Jumer's Casino Hotel and Resort in uh, Rock Island, Illinois. And the reason they're doing that is sports betting. That's the main reason to pick up Jumer's. They bought that from Delaware North. Okay. Uh, over in, in Pennsylvania, uh, the Eagles and DraftKings have announced a deal. Uh, you know, DraftKings just did a deal with uh, the Giants. I thought that, you know, didn't the Eagles just do a deal with... Uh, Fox Bet. Fox Bet, yeah, no. The Fox Bet is having a studio with over in uh, Lincoln Financial yep. Field where the Eagles play. They're going to be now, doing content with them there. Now they're, they just, the Eagles just did a deal with DraftKings? Yep. For uh, DraftKings is now the official Daily Fantasy Sports Partner and the official sports betting partner of the Eagles. Great. Uh, they're going to have the exclusive naming rights to the field club at Lincoln Financial Field. You're more familiar with this stuff as an Eagles fan than I, I am. I don't know where the field club is. That's, that's uh, I my. I, <laughs> I, I was in the st- stadium a couple times, but I don't know where the field club is. But it's going to be called the DraftKings Field Club. All right. Offer VIP experiences, exclusive game day access featuring an on-field viewing area in the north end zone. Interesting. So you're you're going to see a DraftKings viewing party sometime. You know, once Once people come back. Once people come back, I'm I'm sure there's going to be signs all over the stadium. So, yeah, definitely I'll check it out. So uh, that's what's going on around uh, the country today uh, uh, for the Turnpike Sports Book Report. As always, there's going to be additional stories on the blog. Just head on over to turnpikesportsradio.com. Click on the blog button, and these will be posted after the show is uh, published. And that'll do it for us. If you're going out to one of the newly reopened casinos or sportsbooks, please stay safe. And you know what? Wear a mask. We'll see you next time on the Turnpike. 